and you immediately know the association that's made with witchcraft and the occult. And the alewife is directly associated with that. The, economy, uh, the iconography of the witch blends in with the, uh, with the alewife. And we see uh, such uh, images of the um, alewife as presented in, for example, the uh, uh, famous poem, the Tuning of uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, by the poet laureate of King Henry VIII, no a love, uh, friend of woman, uh, describing the alewife. And it's not a pretty picture. And here's a quick, uh, I haven't got time to read the whole uh, a poem or even a, a picture of it or a piece of it, but you can see here that the alewife is represented like in this drawing on this period. Uh, she's got warts on her nose, really ugly, uh, uncertain morals. And Skelton uh, describes it as she brews a noppy ale and maketh thereof a vast sail to travelers and tinkers, to sweaters and swinkers, and all good ale drinkers. Instead of coin and money, some bring her a honey and some a pot of honey, some salt and a spoon, and their hose and their shone. Okay, here's uh, another a little uh, more friendly uh, image. Let's leave it with that one. Again, the broom and the alewife and the traveler. Now, this characteristics of this pre-modern manufacturing, including uh, beer, is the same across all forms of uh, production in the medieval and early modern uh, period. That is, it's a small scale production produced for a local market, beer spoils very quickly, so it's not distributed at any great uh, distance. It's for immediate consumption, and it is based on craft or tacit knowledge. Craft or tacit knowledge. Now, the first real brewing recipes were written down uh, only uh, much, much later with the rise of industrial beer. And I actually have to own one of those first brewing manuals that were done for industrialized beer. And it is a very valuable piece in my uh, collection at my office. And it's a wonderful thing. I can maybe send people a, a PDF link over that if anybody's interested and they can contact me. So how do we get from craft knowledge to the modern science of beer and the modern world of a uh, 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 modern civilized industrial world? and its relationship to uh, beer. Well, uh, certainly the characteristics of the development of modernity, of course, the end of the old word, world, but the birth of the modern form of production. And this is associated with measurement and precision. And this we can see right across the scientific revolution, right up to the enlightenment, that these become characteristics of what it is to be modern, that there's a modern form of production, that measurement and precision is the ground of our sciences rather than the qualitative uh, notions of science existing before, and that there's a close relationship between science and technology, and in uh, modernity, that there's an intricate relation between thermodynamics, heat, and light. So let me address these things and the relationship of beer to thermodynamics, heat, and light. Now, the first step is the rise of factories, which in brewing means the rise of this thing called the common brewer, which uh, is the enclosures of factories. Everybody knows this from the textile story, uh, but it mostly happens in brewing, where, a con where uh, individual craft brewing is enclosed in a factory system uh, where uh, the production of beer is happened in a common sense. It's not common because it's commonly owned. It's actually the site of large scale capital. But look at the difference between this and the alehouse. We now have a huge factory belching out the dark satanic mills of um, Blake and his descriptions of modern England, if you like. The enclosures of cottage industry into one location built on one site with large amount of capital. And the capital being generated by these common brewers is the largest of any form of manufacturing, put textiles and uh, pottery to uh, shame. It produces such uh, rich 
uh, uh, political influential uh, figures like this, which one of uh, these two uh, done is a wonderful caricature by James Gilroy in the early uh, modern career in 1799, twin uh, stars, Castor and Prolex, you know them from Gemini. Well, these are the, actually the uh, great Whig politicians, uh, George Barclay and Charles Stewart, uh, multi-gazillionaires by modern uh, standards, and also the ones that are going to uh, control parliament in the reform period, they are both brewers. And I love this uh, drawing, it's them showing their opulence uh, uh, built by uh, their large common brewing uh, manufacturers. Now, if you compare these to the uh, Brewster, the female brewers of a, pre uh, a previous period, you can see the radical change that happens in the birth of the modern, especially in the 18th and 19th century. Now, what happens here in these factories um, and uh, this new relation of beer to commerce? So let's have a look at that. The beer and the scientific revolution. And I'm gonna attempt to show you that the uh, in these new uh, um, uh, crucibles, I guess, a new relationship to nature, more uh, method and science is gonna happen exactly in the site and it's gonna happen in uh, the common breweries. Beer is at the center of the, simply is at the center of the scientific revolution of the immediate preceding period uh, uh, leading up to the 18th and 19th century and certainly uh, filling in to full flourishing, uh, I guess, in uh, the 18th and 19th century. And it's through measurement and the control of beer, now in the common brewery and subject to taxes and government control and a desire for mass control. It's in those places that we see our focus in science towards measurement and control. So the scientific revolution is one about beer and taxes. And I'll go over quickly three important uh, developments. The first is the rise of mathematics, measure, and calculus. And I bet you that some of you will be surprised to learn of this uh, relationship. We often associate calculus and the infinitesimals with Leibniz and Newton and maybe astronomy, but nope, it's in beer for heaven's sakes. The first text on calculus and infinitesimals was written by John uh, uh, Johann Kep Kepler, sorry, in his study of the measure of the volume of irregular solids, as, uh, meaning uh, uh, not platonic solid objects, and in this case, beer and wine barrels. And it's his, his uh, text right here on the measuring of beer and wine barrels. And you'll see how it works. You can imagine, right? Is that you divide the barrel into increasingly small volumes and then add them up, approaching the infinitesimally small and adding them up so that you can measure the, uh, the barrel without having to drain it out and drink the contents. And this is very important, not only for the manufacturers, but for the tax uh, taxation system, which was uh, taxing by um, quantity. But it's also not only taxing by quantity, it's taxing a uh, beer manufacturer by uh, uh, a, a, a quality or a, a amount of alcohol. And in our discovery of specific gravity and density, we find beer at the very locale. Here is a, a Robert Boyle and his uh, famous hydrometer of which he invented first to study the density of metals to find counterfeiters. But it was immediately by Boyle himself transferred from counterfeit uh, 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 susser outers uh, uh, to the um, the uh, alcohol content and density of beer for taxation. And so the development of the hydrometer is a beer related move on the part of the taxation uh, uh, um, uh, economy 
uh, using the Royal Society as its scientific base to now create proper taxes on, uh, on beer. But it's in this particular text, which I have a, a copy of, Michael Combrun, an essay on brewing with the establishing, the uh, view of establishing the principle of the art from 1758, that we see a radical change in everything to do with beer. Even though it didn't catch on for a few years, it's still here that we see a manifesto for uh, the relationship between science and production and beer. Publi this published in 1758, an essay on brewing with a, new, uh, uh, with a view of establishing the principles of the art. Now look at this frontispiece. Maybe I'll zoom in a bit on it. There you go, there's some zooming. Now we see the usual ingredients of uh, beer, especially in the uh, 18th century. We have hops uh, at the side, we have grains in the center, we have an eagle. They actually used to make be uh, uh, meat beer, by the way. My, some of my students tried this and in my early modern uh, first manual brew making and has various sorts of birds or a piece of beef that you would throw in the thing. But the eagle's not there to enhance the, uh, the flavor of the beer that Mon uh, Combrun is discussing, but rather it's holding something. It's the eagle of knowledge, if you like, and it's holding a thermometer, a new device that will now be applied to do the production and especially production of beer, the thermometer. The precision thermometer invented by Daniel uh, Fahrenheit uh, in the 18th century and taken up immediately by Hermann Boyer-Hover uh, and his use in clinical practice. But its very first large scale application is in the control of beer making and brewing. Combroom is um, unlike anything that we've seen before. And he presents careful tables to show the relationship between temperature, quantities, and results. And now he presents a new form of proceeding and relating, uh, uh, sorry, between production and the relationship of time and temperature uh, and the producing of beer. And, uh, what are the results of this? Even though it takes some time to ta uh, take on through the Brewsters, they eventually take this up as their manifesto. And what is the results? Well, we see a radical and pointed removal of that tacit knowledge, the exclusion of women from the process, but also the whole notion of tacit knowledge, uh, getting a beer just right by its look or by its feel, or uh, by uh, you know whether you could do the dishes while doing it or something like that is now going to be standardized by measurements of time and temperature and quantity. And it is the creation of these standards by instruments that allows for the precision and replicability. And it's taken up by the Brewsters on each step of the process. And the result is the creation of these huge factories. And here's, look at these vats. This is from the Barclay uh, and Perkins breweries. Those two big guys that I sh uh, showed you uh, that are running politics in Britain. This is their brewery. And look at the size of those. These are enormous. Uh, I was gonna talk to you a little bit about the great London beer flood of 1814. Some of you might know it where 6.7 meter tall wooden vats like this uh, uh, broke their wooden bound, uh, bonds or their wooden staves, sorry, and exploded onto the street in a five meter high beer tsunami into the slum of St. Giles, which is just south of now the British Museum, killing eight people and uh, washing away several. It took out five at an Irish wake, which is, I don't know, irony or justice. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, this is a lot of friggin beer. And it is only in the sights of the huge Brewsters and the measurement stories uh, that uh, create the grounds of their production. The rise of the common 
industrialized brewery factories faced a backlash, though, of those defending.